Uh, kia ora tato. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I hear it was very, it was very pleasant. That's great. <laughs> right. Okay, we move through to number nine. And we, we're trying to get some traction here and some pace going, so um, I'll invite... <laughs> <laughs> I'll invite, yeah, one question between two councillors, yeah. So I'll invite um, Andrew and, and Tony up um, from our community planning team, and this is around uh, page 19, adopting the draft vision, goals and principles to inform the 2024 uh, 34 LTP. Yep. Over to you. And to help that pace, we're happy to take this as red. <laughs> okay, we're catching up. All right. Councillor Naylor. Um, I'm happy to move 1B and 2B at 2-1B. Sorry, can we say that again? Um, we're, we're, in, we're in questions, councillor. Is there any questions of the officers? No. Sorry. <laughs> I was just following the quick thing that you were suggesting. Yeah. One yeah, well, I, wasn't, I was actually going to move one A. Oh, okay, then that's all right. Is there any other questions? Of, I mean, this is quite a big topic. I'm surprised we haven't got a question or two. Okay. 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 All right. Um, so we have the resolutions there in front of us. We'll just deal with the um, vision one first. And uh, this is around he he hiti. Sorry. He hiti ra. He hiti ra. He hiti. Panamu, small city benefits, big city ambition, um, or um, small city benefits, big city opportunities. And there's C there noting that some of the wording reflects council's aspirations for the 2434 LTP, noting that in this case, the appropriateness of he iti ra, he iti panamu will need to be checked, because um, it's not a direct translation, I believe. Okay, um, I was keen on moving 1A. I know you want to move 1B. <laughs> um, but does, do I have a seconder for 1A? Councillor Isabella. And we can just, it's going to be one or the other, so I think it really matters. So, um, look, councillors, um, I'd, I've actually just been off the phone with um, Rangi Tane, and I know that their ambition is, is around ambition. Or aspiration, I should say, is around ambition. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lose any sleep if it's ambition or opportunities. But I do think, as a city, and just having come back where I have in the last week, that we do have to have some ambition. There's opportunities, and sometimes opportunities and ambition do mean different things. Um, people, there was some discussion around ambition just being um, around growth at all costs. I don't believe it is. People can have ambition to a certain level. Um, but as a city, I do think we need to have an eye to the future. Um, do we want to be what we are now, forever? Or do we want to have a little bit more foresight in that? Um, opportunities exist all the time. It's just a matter of whether you take them or not. So in that case, I'm, I'm more in favour of staying with what we've got in terms of ambition, but I was very happy to have it debated and challenged. Um, but I think, we, I think we've come to um, uh, a good understanding that the small city benefits is rock solid, um, and that's something that um, the city is benefiting from now at the moment. Um, but actually, do we want to have some... Um, uh, Facilities, some stuff that happens in bigger cities uh, that um, we need to get scale and have some more advancement, and a lot of that comes with ambition. So, um, yeah, I'm more than happy to put that forward. I open it up. Um, Councillor Arnott. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was just wondering if we could have some sort of indication from officers what sort of cost it's going to be to change our statement. Um, you know, to be honest, A and B, I'm not really too fast. Um, but yeah, if we could get some sort of an idea of what the cost is going to be to change, that would be great. Thank you. Not even with advertising and whatever's minimal? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Just um, speaking briefly to what I will be supporting, which is um, 1B, so I won't support A. I think we have had A for the last six years, and it's had its time. I believe that um, pro um, progress, you know, highlighting this, the opportunities that the city has um, highlights what the city offers now and in the future. Um, just highlighting what the city's ambition is for the future um, focuses on what it might be in the future, but I think it's more comprehensive to talk about the opportunities that exist now and in the future. So I don't think that people would move here because of what we want to be in the future. I think they move here for the opportunities that exist now. Um, and I think businesses would be attracted here because of the opportunities that exist now and in the future. So that's, that's really why I um, prefer the B option and would be happy to move B if this one fails. Councillor Harpeter. I'm really keen to support this one. Um, I think the difference between the two is quite um, minimal, but I do think that ambition is um, where a lot of people that are either in business or in the community or, you know, whether they're in sport or whatever they are in, um, actually can identify with the word ambition as opposed to opportunity. So I just think it's a word that people can relate to, so that's why I prefer the word ambition as opposed to opportunity. So I prefer to stick with the word ambition. That's why I support it. Councillor Isabella. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, so I also am a big supporter of ambition as a way to encapsulate our vision. Um, ambition to me speaks to how we want to be. Opportunities to, to me speaks to uh, what we want to look for or what we want to provide or what we want to get. I'm really interested for a vision in who we want to be and in aiming high. I'm very ambitious for our city. Our goals are really ambitious. The projects that we are embarking on or want to embark on are really ambitious because it's about who we want to be, not necessarily all the things that we want to provide. It's sitting above that. I just wanted to share with you some of my thoughts on ambition, which are reflected in this little quote here. Ambition is necessary to accomplishment. Without ambition to gain an end, nothing would be done. Without ambition to excel in others and surpass oneself, there would be no superior merit. To win anything, we must have the ambition to do so. I think most of our, in my opinion, some of our biggest goals are sitting under goal four, and I'm very ambitious that we encapsulate that. I feel that opportunities, while good, does not have that same breadth of informing who it is that is our identity that we're trying to present. Ambition encapsulates opportunities, but is still ambitious enough to attract external partners and interest in our city. Uh, so I will be supporting uh, 1A. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fitzgerald. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Andrew and Tony. Um, I find myself in a bit of a, a difficult space in this because I'm looking at the, the, the whakatoki, which is the proverb that's presented in front of us, and it's in Te Reo Māori, which is beautiful. Um, and I was just reflecting that um, that's not a... It, it's a relatively new... Māori proverb, but it's actually taken from the original proverb, which is um, aha koa he iti, so although it may be small, he ponamu, it is of immense value. And that original whakatoke, that original proverb, 
was actually speaking to gifting something to somebody else that is of immense value. Um, so it's not that I disagree with the ambition or the opportunities, um, but the three options that are placed in front of me pushes me to, I can only support option C. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor. Option C reads, some other wording that reflects Council's aspirations for the 2024-34 LTP. Note that in this case, the appropriateness of he iti ra, he iti po number would need to be checked. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, Councillor Dennison. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm going to stand up to oppose the big city ambition uh, for these reasons. I and not that opportunity is the next best word, but I think at the season that we're in, I think it would sit most appropriately without doing a big new exploration reflecting the aspirations with new wording. I think we should just uh, adjust it rather than recreate it. Um, if, I, if I was thinking what's the essence that we're wanting to reflect is a people-centred city and, and having people first. And ambition in the cost of living environment that we're in right now is just a word that kind of irks me to think that we're f promoting this at, as a city vision, knowing full well that people are going to find it, if they aren't already now, entering into a year and period of where they need to adjust and tighten their own budgets and um, consider you know, real financial um, decisions for their own future. And ambition just does not sit well with me in this, in this period. And, and so for that reason, I think opportunity does provide opportunities for uh, not only the living big and living um, with investment, just enjoy, opportunities to enjoy the lifestyle that we op offer here. Uh, the location, uh, the culturally infused aspects of, that we celebrate so much. And so opportunity can, um, can be achieved by everybody, in my mind, when ambition is, is not in everyone's checkbook. Uh, and, that's, um, and that's the absolute bottom line of it. So for my mind, I'm voting against this. I don't want a new hash of all the words creating it, but I think opportunity will sit better for this period. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Good. No other comments? Right. OK, just do write a reply, because... I think it's quite important. Um, visions are not just about here and now. They're about medium and longer term vision. Um, so I, I take your comments, Councillor, about there being some um, uh, hard times at the moment and possibly even for the next year. But I start all of my city state of the, state of the city speeches with, it's like an aeroplane ride. We've got a bit of turbulence as we're getting up, but we're going to get into some clear air. And I definitely think that the city is in that space. We've got a diverse economy and, um, and diverse people that are here too. I think it's personally how you see ambition. Some people aren't ambitious, and that's fine. You don't have to be. But for those that are, it is, like Councillor Isabella said, it's about pushing oneself. Opportunities can fall into your lap. And as a city, you've got to be careful you don't become complacent. So... I would urge you to have that desire to keep improving. That's what ambition means. It doesn't mean expensive projects or a dollar value attached to things. It's about what you want to achieve. It's what you want to attract. And it is about pushing oneself, in this case, a city. And we do need to keep doing that. And it's not about here and now. It is about the medium and the longer term as well. So I urge you to have a look at this. I take on board Councillor Fitzgerald's um, comments about um, it's not being exact translation and, and, and his, his uh, uh, view on C, uh, but it isn't an exact translation. And so I believe that we still have real um, connection to what our, our current vision at the moment, even if it is six years old, it doesn't matter as long as people understand it and live it. I'll ask you to vote, please. And it's passed um, nine votes for and seven against.
Okay, the next part is adopting our city goals to inform the development of the 23-24 LTP. So again, we have um, some that have changed, and we have to figure out number one, which is around um, economics, is whether an innovating and growing city or an innovative and prosperous city. Number two, we're all very agreed that a creative and exciting city is there and a connected and safe community is number three. Number four, the eco-city, um, there was a view that that was perhaps a brand of a past um, year and isn't it, isn't it funny when we first came here and those that were around the table as long as I can remember the sustainability and <laughs> prosperous and, and resilient city um, vision so it's funny how that comes around again. So we've now got, for number four, a sustainable and resilient city. Um, I'm happy to move um, 1A and 2, 3 and 4, if I could have a second there. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, again, for the same reasons people did have some negativity around growth, and we've always been a city that's had sustainability at its heart around growth, not growth for growth's sake. So prosperous is a very good word as well, but it, it just brings me back to why we had uh, those again. Can remember Peter Smith came to us and we did the workshop around uh, owning this for ourselves rather than just being a, uh, a, a somewhat vanilla um, group of um, plans. And I think there was about 38 plans that we had and they all had very vanilla names. So it was really about owning that ourselves. And there was a view around the council table at that time that we did need to, to grow as a city. And I think that view is still there. But again, it's, it's tempered. Uh, it doesn't mean to say we take it out of our, out of our goal. So I'll open that up for comments. Councillor Naylor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I won't be supporting um, 1A. I would prefer... 1B, um, an innovative and prosperous city. My reason is that I think we are, our goal here should be something that is to do with everyone doing well, not simply a size thing. If we, if we measure the success of this goal based on whether we're getting bigger, then I think that's a really narrow way to determine the pro, um, you know, how well everyone in our city is doing. To, to me, Prosperous talks about everyone doing well. I don't think we need to be getting bigger for that to occur. I would rather us be aspiring to everyone in our city doing well, whether we're the current size, whether we're bigger, whether we're smaller. To me, the size is not the issue. Um, I'll leave it there. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues, for the opportunity to comment here. Um, <clears throat> I'm very much in the, in the space of supporting um, prosperity. I think it's quite a, a clear winner in terms of how we'd want to frame um, that first goal. Prosperity is a much better way of framing the positive outcomes that we can get out of economic development. We talk about economic development. That should be for prosperity, not simply for something as narrow as growth. Um, and it's a much more inclusive um, economic paradigm, so I'm quite keen that we do um, decline the opportunity that's put in front of us in this, in this recommendation and, and vote instead for um, an innovative and um, prosperous city. So I'd ask for separation around one so that we can um, proceed in that manner. Thank you. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't really like debates where we're arguing over a single word, so I'm just going to be brief. Growth is a reality. We've all sat around this table and talked about the huge amount of money that's needed um, to get our city growing, to rezone Kakatangiata, to get the inner urban development going, and to provide those opportunities for people in our city to have warm, safe and dry housing. Growth is what that's about to me. And so I feel by throwing growth out the window for prosperity, we aren't doing justice to the reality of the situation we're in at the moment, which is we need to grow. People want to move here. The lockdowns have shown that um, we being trapped up in the biggest city in the country isn't necessarily where you want to be. We've seen huge influx into our region um, as a result of COVID, and people want to be here. 
So growth is not just a reality, but I think growth is an important goal, as long as it is sustainable, which our other goals talk about. These goals don't just work in isolation. Growth works in line with being sustainable and resilient. It works in line with being connected as a community. So I'm not against the word prosperous, but I feel like growth is far more appropriate for not just the situation we're in as a city, but for the city that we want to be. And for those reasons, I think, or for those reasons, I will be supporting the word growing. Councillor Harpeter. Um, try not to repeat anything that Councillor Wood has just said, but I do think that innovative and growing city is the better word because um, we are a city that needs to grow our, particularly our housing portfolio. But um, growth um, is very much where we need to head as a city because we do need the um, housing um, space and, and houses for the, our city. So that's why I'm, I'm supporting that, that, that word. Thank you. Councillor Isabella. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, uh, I'm in favour of prosperous over growth. Growth is something that is happening to us, um, whether it's a goal or not. As Councillor Wood pointed out, COVID has not been goal related to us, but it has seen a large influx into our city. So whether we have it as a goal or not, it's something that's likely and projected to be happening to us anyway. Prosperity to me um, really reflects how we're dealing with that growth, how we're preparing for it with people at the front and centre of that. I'll just leave that there, thank you. Look, I'll have a right of reply. Uh, if there's no more comments, there isn't. Um, look, this isn't a size thing, and I think it's, you, again, we come back to, to your understanding maybe of economics and business and also your personal perceptions. Um, and as a former business person, and there's a few around the table, um, growth is an absolute necessity. You cannot run economics, have business, um, without, without growth. As Councillor Wood said, it comes in many forms, uh, and there is sustainability around it. it has, it's, that's one great thing that the city's done. Um, it hasn't gone hunting for growth like perhaps uh, the Taurongas and the Hamiltons have, where it becomes uncontrollable. We do have a, a valve or a safety valve on this, so, uh, but I think if you take growth out, you're pretty well saying to the businesses and the economic community, we just want everybody to be the same. Prosperity is an outcome, really. It's an outcome of economics, and, and, and it's probably misunderstood. So I believe growth is the, the way we should be looking. So happy to take that separately and ask you to support it and vote, please. And that's um, passed, nine votes for and seven against. We'll do now two, three and four. I don't think we need to, I don't think there's much debate on this, so we'll just vote on this. past 15 for and one against. Right, we now move to number three. And these are around confirming our principles, or I call them values, uh, as in to inform the development of the LTP, and being inclusive, open, ambitious, bold, enabling, guardianship and caring. Um, and the background to that's in the paper. Um, or, B, the council adopt a new set of draft principles. I'm happy to move um, 3A. If I could have a second, I think you, Deputy Mayor. I'll open it up for any comments. Other than I think these are really um, pretty universal. Uh, we debated this at some length the last time we did, and I don't think it's changed. 
The only thing I'd say to officers, they were a little bit hidden in some of our documentation. And when I've looked at other councils, including some metros, um, they're right up front and centre of some of their work. Um, and look, I know that all of those, again, I call them values. Um, we, we, we work with those or, uh, and, and use those every, every day of what we do here. So um, I think they need to be a bit more prominent. That's my personal view. Are there any other comments? No? We will vote, please. That has passed 16 votes for, none against, thank you. Okay, I think... Oh, number four. The council received... Hi ahura nahi wananga matua. That what really matters to inform the development of the 20, 20, sorry, 2024, 34 LTP, uh, and that is the document a very flash-looking document in Appendix 1. I'm happy to move that. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Uh, open it up for comments. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, colleagues. Just wanted to briefly acknowledge this and acknowledge the work that the community put into this. I feel like it's given us a really good running start and focused approach that we might not have otherwise had. And I, from my recollection, it is a, a new element to, to how we approach um, these things and just want to acknowledge and appreciate those that have contributed to it and look forward to continuing to refer to it as we um, work away for the coming months to get us across the line for the long-term plan. Thank you. Councillor Dennison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the only point I wanted to comment on this is around the student research project and why the numbers that responded weren't high, actually. Um, some of the feedback, I think, we just really, uh, I personally found a little bit um, fronting to consider that we have promote, promoted ourselves as a student city and positioned ourselves in that way, and yet the feedback um, is really coming through that it, there's an overarching felt by students that Palmerston North is, is not designed for them and undeveloped in the student culture. Uh, other things that come out that they feel like they're a visitor rather than calling Palmerston North home. And... Um, and so, really, I think we should note that, and um, if we truly do want to engage and be the student city, understanding that the age of a, of a student isn't a typical student, um, school leaver um, necessarily that's studying at Massey, the, the range in age and, and even the extramural option that Massey um, has great strengths in, um, gives it a diverse um, enrolment. Um, and so... For us, I think, for us, looking forward, we want to be a young city and, and, and a young life and vibrant, uh, but actual fact, I think we're going to have some self-reflection in this next long-term planning and, and put some initiatives in place to make sure that we strengthen up in those spaces. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Yeah, I just also wanted to say that this was a really good initiative, um, that it was super helpful to have this right up front at the start. Um, and I also like the way that um, we were engaged with some of the, um, you know, key organisations in the community um, up front to hear from them first before we do any uh, thinking about the draft. And in the past, when I reflect on it, um, you know, the first LTP that I was involved with, um, we worked on the draft and then we put it out to the community and, and everybody was invited to come and say what they thought but we had already got it substantially in place. And so at that point, you're really um, not able to make huge revisions. The second LTP, and we had a process um, as we were forming it where we spoke to um, four different um, sectors of the community and, and had a kind of a, an, an engagement uh, where they spoke to us and we asked some questions about what was important for them. But... Uh, this third LTP, I think that this is a, a significant improvement, um, both in terms of the 
do, you know, the, the fact that it's a written document that we can refer back to continually, the fact that we've engaged with these organisations really early on in the piece before we've even had any discussions ourselves on, on where we might be going. And I think it's a much better model of engagement than we've used previously. So I'm grateful to the organisations that put the time in to, uh, you know, give us some really quite detailed and direct feedback, actually, which was really good to hear. Um, and also to um, whoever's idea it was to do this, because um, I thought it's really helpful. Thanks. Thank you, councillors. Um, look, just a couple of comments from me to, to wind up. Um, again, thank you. Uh, my thanks too to the officers and the and the contributors. I too noted the student commentary, and it was pretty sobering actually when you start reading it. Um, and it was more than just one person, so. That's something we need to take on board. Um, it isn't all us, of course. It's some of our partners involved in that. Um, but, um, yeah, as Councillor Dennison said, it was, um, you know, we do pride ourselves in some of that space. And it was, look, it's you've got to look in the mirror at times and just say, have we changed? And yes, we have. Um, and um, have we changed for the better? And, and, and in some cases, perhaps not. So we still want to be attractive to younger people and, uh, and, and and there's reasons why cities like Hamilton and Otago and even Wellington um, are, are attracting uh, great numbers. Um, the sectors were really good, and I think it does give us a, an, a really great overlay. A couple of big sectors, though, where I think have we got all the players there? Housing's one. We've heard from the public and the social side. But where's the Real Estate Institute? And they have a huge part to play in, in what happens in the, in the total market. Um, and the other with heritage, um, we had the historic places, trust, and they, don't get me wrong, they're great, but they look after sort of buildings um, or, or focus on the building side, whereas heritage is more than just buildings. And perhaps the heritage trust should be somewhere in the mix, or well, certainly some commentary because they do perhaps represent a broader, a, a broader um, snapshot of, the, of that sector. But overall, really good, and I think... Um, this is the right way to do it. It's at the start rather than at the end. So I think we've got the order right. OK. No more comments. We will vote, please. It has passed 16 votes for and none against. Thank you. Right, we'll move through to number 10 now which is our business assurance report uh, around uh, long-term plan review of programs. And I invite Masuma to, and this is on page 65 of our papers, thanks. Oh, sorry, Andrew and, and Tony back again. Thank you all. Um, I might just ask Andrew Way from... Oh, there he is. He's popped on online. Um, this is a review that was required through the Business Assurance Formal Work Programme that was approved by Council. There were two reviews separate to... Well, there were two individual reviews that we've combined because we just felt that it would be a better delivery of the review and they were quite linked together. The review was outsourced to KPMG to support us with it. So I do have Andrew online and I'll let him introduce the report first and then I might add to it before we open up to questions. Thanks, Masuma. Um, hi everyone, I'm Andrew Wade. I'm a director at KPMG and we supported Masuma on, on this report. Um, thanks for the opportunity to introduce it briefly. Uh, we completed most of this work at the end of last year, in the second half of last year, and it consisted of uh, around 20 interviews with various council officers and also some uh, returning elected members, as well as a review of uh, documents from the LTP, um, both the final products, but also the workshop material and other other inputs that were in, in the process. Uh, I'll take the sort of report largely as read, but as you would have seen, our, our focus was on the, the planning, budgeting and prioritisation aspects of the LTP. And while we make a series of recommendations across those, 
I think the biggest area of improvement that we identified was around the way levels of service set and the, the budgets that sit behind them and the opportunity for elected members to be provided with better information on what the council provides, the cost of doing so and its effectiveness. And I think that uh, is also reflected in, in the management comment. But as I said, we, we make uh, recommendations across a range of areas. I think just as an overall point, um, I mean, we acknowledge that the council officers have taken steps to improve the LTP over time, and certainly our engagement officers was positive on that, that they were aware of many of the issues that we were identifying and were actively thinking of ways that uh, those that the process could be improved, and therefore a lot of our recommendations are more improvements on current practice rather than, than wholesale change necessary, uh, necessarily. And the final thing I'd say is, you know, this was inherently a look at the previous LTP process. I know your current one is, is underway and some improvements, I believe, are already being incorporated into that. But it was essentially um, looking at the development of the previous few LTPs. Uh, so I'll pass back to Ms. Suma, but happy to take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> um, just quickly with regards to the scope of the review and just giving some context, of course, um, the four elements that we looked at were firstly the planning. So when you guys receive the LTP, you'll receive some program summary sheets. Some of you will be familiar with those. We looked at the quality of those through this review, we looked at the process and how informative were they? What's the purpose that they serve and are they serving that purpose? We then looked at budgets of course, from time to time we are very on point with our budgets and some of the times we're not. So we wanted to see what is that process that we follow and how could that be improved or how, how can we provide you with the right information so that you are making more informed decisions for the future of the city as well. We then looked at prioritisation. Of course, when you get all these program summary sheets, it's which one goes first, which one do you do, which one do you put in year two. So what is the process that we're following and do you have the right information when you are prioritising those? How can we improve that? And lastly, benefits. Of course, we don't do anything without a reason, but is that reason being articulated well and are we then actually tracking and or checking if we are realising those benefits. So those are the things we wanted to check in this review. I don't think the review highlighted anything that's a surprise to anybody. Well, hopefully most of it is something that we already knew. I think this is an excellent opportunity to do some kind of stock take as to this is everything we need to improve. These are all the recommendations that have come out of it. What do we do now and what do we focus on now? Management in their comment in the memorandum have highlighted what they think the focus could be and what we could prioritise because we can't do everything in one LTP. It's probably going to take, it's a journey and it's probably going to take a couple, maybe even three LTP rounds to get everything perfect. Well, not perfect, but close to perfect. Two, two. Maybe two. Um, but I think what we would like to hear from elected members today is where do you want us to focus so that we can use that guidance to develop a detailed roadmap and help improve the process by which we de develop a long-term plan. Happy to open up to questions. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Soma, and um, thank you, uh, Andrew, is it, online? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Look, um, I'm just, um, and look, I think it's been great to have this, um, I suppose, high-level overview. And just on those subjects around planning, budgeting, prioritisation, I'm, I'm really just interested in where the red ink is, and um, and understanding how we're going to change some of that and get that into a into a green, then obviously a uh, I think the yellow is better, isn't it? Yeah. So um, we've got uh, three lots of it there around planning um, and then budgeting around MSL budgets and then prioritisation around information being sent to elected members. Can I just get some commentary around that on perhaps how we're going to improve those pieces? Is that a question directed to management around what they will now do with this, or is it more well, from yeah, the I mean, reviewer? Well, yeah, I mean, the perp you've asking, you're asking us for um, our thoughts on it, and I'm, yeah. Our intent, I mean, when we looked through the report, sort of the common theme was provide better information to let the members to help you make um, choices and trade-offs. So our intention is to 
provide you with more information at the activity and the maintained service level budget um, information so that you can make those trade-offs. So it's really outlined to you on page 67. The intent, we would bring you back information about each activity that tried to link the services better to the budgets. Um, I recall through some of the annual budget debate, you talked about the black box of maintained service level budgets. The intent of this is to, to start to open that up. And when I say start, I don't mean that we're gonna keep some back, but it's, 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 it's gonna be, it's not gonna be straightforward. So we, we will give you the best information that we can at a reasonably high level about the, how the budget supports the levels of service and what those levels of service actually mean to people and the difference they will make. You can then make more informed trade-offs between levels of service, but also between levels of service and programs. Whatever trade-off you want to make, you'll hopefully be able to make them in a more informed way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Wood. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one question. Um, thank you, Andrew. On page 78, it talks about fixed nominal baselines, and you say, while we have not recommended a similar approach to the PNCC, it's an approach we could consider. I just want to understand why you haven't recommended it. Is that because it's outside the scope of this report for you to make such a recommendation, or is it just because you don't think it's the right thing for us to do within the scope of the report? Thanks. Yeah, so as I mentioned in the report, central government works largely on fixed nominal baselines. Um, I think the reason I haven't recommended that is it's quite a bold step to, to do that. Um, and I think I think our recommendation would be there's other smaller, more iterative steps that could be done first, which would allow counts, elected members to get more comfortable in looking at the, the black box, as it were, and how that changes over time. Um, before moving to a, a stage where you know every adjustment is essentially a, a new bid or a new program um, that needs that needs approval and prioritisation, so we're not sort of ruling that out that that's a legitimate tool that is used in places, but it's it's not sort of our first recommendation or, or what we think you should do first. Appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report. Now, I'm looking on page um, 81 um, under the previous approaches to program prioritisation, and the last, the third bullet point there talks about the public excluded workshops that have been a big part of our um, prioritisation um, previously, um, and talks about that as being a detrimental feature of the process. And then it says, we understand, however, that this will change in the upcoming LTP. And I'm just wondering what, in what way we can expect that to look different. Um, I mean, first off, all workshops are now public. So that would include the, the prioritisation workshops. We are looking at ways that we can improve the, the information we give to you about the programmes, but at the same time we're balancing that against the information need you have for maintained service levels. So we, we've got some ideas on how we can improve the programme prioritisation and we will bring those back to you. But in particular, any prioritisation workshop that you hold will be a public workshop in the same way that all your workshops are public, unless you decide otherwise. And will those workshops be publicly advertised as, so that people actually know they're occurring? Yes. I understand this, this, I mean, this business as usual. It happens now. Well, sorry, um, uh, my observation is that um, for the paper that we've just had, on the vision that we've had two workshops on those and I don't believe they were open. One was at Keisha Birch and one was at Macora Lodge. So I They were online, councillor. On yeah. I think the Macora Lodge one was a retreat rather than a workshop, but certainly the one at Keisha Birch was advertised. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. And our intent would be that from here on in, we'd say would all be workshops. Yeah. But again, that's in your hands more than more than ours. Okay. Is, can I just follow on from that? So, is there a, a reason why that prioritisation needs to happen in workshops as opposed to um, actual meetings? No, and that is part of the process that we can we're looking at at the moment and can bring back to you. Yes. Okay. I mean, at the moment we have scheduled two all-day workshops, and I guess that would be the the only thing where a workshop does help is that a workshop ensures that um, the, if a workshop is held after a committee meeting, for example, then the, the time could run from that amount of time to that amount of time. Having it as a sort of a standalone workshop does mean that as staff we know what time we will get to discuss things and hear from you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, uh, Andrew and Masuma and Tony and <laughs> Andrew. Um, so, I've got a, two questions. The first one is around uh, timing. So, there was a comment in the report about sometimes the timing is protracted and sometimes it's rushed, but then I didn't see any corresponding kind of um, action that was going to happen to improve the timing. Uh, you know, to improve the way that we either do things over too long a period or we squish everything up. So is there, a, is there an action somewhere that I haven't seen about that or is there any way that uh, that could be looked at in addition? Andrew, do you, re I, from the top of my mind, I can't tell you if it's in the details somewhere there, but Andrew, do you, in the introduction? But if it isn't I, there, then we can take note of it, of course. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe there's a specific recommendation on that. Right? It's a point that's sort of noted in, in the report, so we could we have a look at amending that if needed. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my second, um, I guess, area of, of question, stroke, comment um, is the last um, item which I think is item 21 in the report around the visibility of programs that were submitted into the LTP process and uh, the recommendation that EM should be provided with some visibility of the full set of programs and a brief description for why they were not submitted to EMs for consideration and I'm wondering why that isn't a recommendation that we're provided with full visibility and an option to consider them or not. I just don't understand why a limit's been put in there. Yeah, no, I can I can answer that. So I think I think maybe the potentially the word sum is is not quite what I'm trying to convey here. So I, I think what we see is that there is a role for the council ELT to provide a level of filtering and putting forward, you know, management's best package of programs with a set of, you know, advice around them, um, rather than just providing sort of wholesale without that to elected members. So I think what we're trying to convey is that what is not included does need to be, you know, shown to elected members, but not necessarily at the same level of depth as what might be in the officer's, um, you know, uh, more preferred package. So it's it's not intended to c convey that some of that would, would be hidden, more just that uh, arguably there'd be just less detail provided for practical reasons for, for those that are not provided to elected members for consideration. So uh, we can look at the wording there. I, I don't think it's, I'm not trying to convey what I what I think you're, um, what it's reading at the moment. Okay, well, because my question would be, you know, how would we, be sure that we had had uh, full visibility of all of the programmes that were put forward. I'm, yep. I mean, I understand that management might say, look, here's the 200 programmes that were put forward and we recommend these 50, but FYI, here's the other 150. But if we have, if we leave this at some visibility, then I, I have a, will have a doubt as to whether or not there might have been some good or otherwise uh, 
programs that we would have wanted to prioritise that we never got the option to see because they've already been filtered through a management lens. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It would be that elected members should see the full, the full 200 um, and, and not only, only 180, which, you know, you see some visibility of those that aren't in the package and then other ones you can see none at all. Uh, that's, that's certainly not uh, my intention with this recommendation. So we can look at the wording then. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, Masuma and um, Andrew, Tony, and Andrew. Uh, <clears throat> my questions are around the um, benefit realization space and benefit tracking. And it, it seemed to me that most of the commentary there was kind of in a fairly short term, kind of quarterly frame. And I wondered if, if that was the intent to kind of limit it. Um, to thinking about that time frame or whether there is thinking at perhaps a three yearly or, or even longer kind of frame around tracking benefits out of the LTP? Uh, again, I don't think it was our intention to restrict um, our recommendations to just short term benefit tracking. I think what was clear was that, you know, the programs that are considered by elected members the summary sheets list a range of benefits that you, uh, and, you know, the idea is that you use that information to make trade-off decisions and then none of those benefits uh, generally track through formal means. Um, mm. And so I think, and, and for many cases, those programs will be, will be multi-year uh, and may even extend, um, will, will extend through multiple LTPs. So, uh, again, that's, the intention is not to focus purely on short term, um, and again, we can look at the wording there if it's, it's giving the wrong impression. Great, thank you. Could I, sorry, if you were going to comment, I assume I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I'll put the question and then feel free to jump in where you want to. Um, kind of my additional question was just understanding what current practice is at Council, just some clarification around the benefit tracking scenario, especially over longer time frames. I may have to ask someone from management to assist with what the current practice is. My, my recollection is there is um, a benefits um, section within the program entry tool, which um, is typically a qualitative explanation of those benefits, and then they will spiral out, I guess, in terms of the broader KPIs that are then uh, monitored across the organisation. So um, I think clearly some work to do in the benefits space. I think I'd agree with that, and that it's quite short and sweet, but that's probably because there wasn't a lot there to actually review. In, in is your view that um, what has come from the consultants and your thinking is, is going to give us some benefit tracking over a, a multi-year type of frame? Yes. Great, thank you. And maybe I can just add, I mean, you know, there's recommendations in here about better business cases. <coughs> so those better business cases would help set those benefit realisation up so that you, we would know what was expected to come out of each programme and then it has a, has a better tracking uh, system being set up for it. And if I can add to the other end of that, once they are set up and once there are better measures in place for benefits, we did a review on our project management discipline not long ago and in that we acknowledged that on the flip end we're not actually assessing if they've been realised well enough either and that should be reported better to governance as well. So that's something that will come out of this review as well. Great, thank you. Uh, so finally then, uh, the, the priority that's currently assigned around that is... Uh, on page 85, it looks like, is is low. Um, how does that relate to kind of when it's going to happen or its risk of kind of getting pushed off the radar again because there's other things that grab the spotlight? I think it's rated as low as, and the recommendations is that anything that's rated low is something that maybe we could look at in the next LTP round and not necessarily focus our attention towards it this time round, but that is open for discussion and very, very open to bringing it forward if required. 
but it isn't something that we'll lose sight of. It's just not necessarily something that we'll pay material attention to. It might be something that requires, or well, we put towards a little less effort. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Dennison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kind of following on around the uh, better business cases that have um, noted in here, and wanting to understand if we're going to take that approach, what's the threshold that's been proposed where government are saying 15 million whole of life cost? Oh, is this something that we will start to incorporate into putting before us as members? And, and how will we start to see that? A threshold as such, and I'll start the answer, but a threshold as such hasn't been suggested and that's something that we as an organisation and you as governance would need to provide some direction on as where that threshold might be and I'm sure there will be advice from management around where an appropriate limit might be as well. But I will pass the no. Is that all? Does that answer? Yeah, I, I still want to understand, so we'll work out what the threshold is. Is this something that we're proposing or is it just noting that it exists? Or I'm just want to understand what's changing from the program summary sheets and then moving down to the um, that, that paragraph there which mentions around the five case better business case. I just want to understand how we're in, um, adopting this or considering this. Which page, sorry, are you on? Uh, this is on 75, page 5 of the detailed findings and recommendations in, within the actual report. 75 of our order paper. I think what the report does acknowledge is that our current program summary sheets are not substitutes for business cases. So it's, it's acknowledging that maybe we would want to, if we are having business cases, we may want to set a threshold and say, any if... And it might not be monetary, it could be complexity and risk and everything. But once we have that criteria, it's suggesting that those business cases should ideally come to you before the LTP program summary sheet does, so that you have that information. Or alternatively, a subs, um, another piece of document that comes with, the sub, comes with the program summary sheet that provides you that additional information. It's just acknowledging that it's not happening and we should consider it, but it hasn't given a proposed... Yeah. Solution is okay. Either. I can accept that it's been there. Thank you. Thank you, Masuma. Thank you, team. Uh, Councillor Harper. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, just looking at page um, 76 with the level of service planning, um, and that's in the red there. So um, looking at B, just wondering um, how that will be a priority for going forward and making a change for what we're doing going forward. So what we are suggesting as, as management is that that is the one that we put the most emphasis on fixing for the current LTP. I mean, in my when I look at that, I think that is about opening up that black box that you talked about through the annual budget. That recommendation is about matching the level of service to the budgets much more clearly so that you can make those sort of trade-offs. And what we are asking is, is that where you want, out of this, where you want the most emphasis put? So have you made that as a recommendation to us? No so that's where we're looking for some guidance as to that. If you look on the memorandum on page 65. 60, Five, yeah. So that's what management are proposing that they could focus their attention on as a, as a result of this report, mm -hmm. but they'll probably need some kind of endorsement from elected members before they go and put a detailed action plan together. And without roll it out. giving you a comment, this is just a whole thing of of recommendation. So we just there's no guidance of what you wanted us to. I mean, I'm sorry to do a comment there, but it's just. What section did you want us to focus on? Our intention was that if you look at page 67 of the covering report, um, is setting out our suggested approach. Okay. So, yes, you're right, we didn't carry that through to a recommendation, but if you were to endorse the, the approach outlined in the management comment, we would know. That's what was meant by that. And if I confused you earlier, just to articulate maybe my thoughts better, is I acknowledge that there are a lot of recommendations and a lot of areas we could improve on, but there are so many of them that 
we don't just want to go and pick and choose what we prioritise over the rest. If you're sitting there and you're looking at the 100 and you're like, this, these five stand out to me and these are important to me, then we'd like to know what those five might be. That's kind of what I was implying. Management have given it a go, and on page 67 they've given you an approach where they think these three things could make a material difference to your next LTP journey. Does that help? Yeah, that's really helpful, but... Um as 16 councillors, it's quite hard for us to decide. So I, I know. I'm sorry to do a comment. Sorry. Councillor Naylor. Sorry, just to follow um, up that question. So um, I guess I'd like just to have this clear in my own mind where we go from today. The next steps talk about an action plan that will, will come to risk and assurance committee. Um, what will be included on that action plan? Is that a result of the 21 recommendations and what we communicate today? We'll put all 21 on the action plan, but which go first and which go last, any guidance we get today may help inform that process. Okay. And so I'm, am I correct that once that action plan comes, then that can still be further refined following? Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's, um, that's the questions done. And uh, thank you, Andrew, online as well. Right, we will go to... We will go to the resolution that Council received, the memo titled Business Assurance Report, uh, Long-Term Plan Review of Programme Planning, Budgeting, Prioritisation and Benefits, and its attachment presented to Council today, 5th of April 2023. I'm happy to move that, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, and I'll open it up for any comment. Uh, Councillor Dennison. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I actually think this is a great report and actually on point to what's required. Uh, we want to be informed and have a snapshot of what difference these decisions will make on the levels of service and the maintained service level budgets. What's been proposed um, when we were at the retreat was suggesting that we need to dive down deep into the level of service budgets, and I've done that a couple of times over my life around this table and found that it's been disproportionate, the amount of time that you invest into it. Uh, the outcome I've found has been very little change in where we set those. And what would be most helpful is actually having some sort of uh, document where you can actually read a snapshot and go, oh, if we want to increase the level of service, it's going to cost this much more and this will be the actual change you could achieve. Or if you want to make a saving, you could, this will be the resulting savings and the, what will be cut off the budget. If we could just do that in our own um, time and get that feel, would, would I think save us that kind of uh, need to kind of dive deep into it once every while and, and get very little change for it. So my mind, I think this is um, going to be helpful information for us. And uh, interesting enough that we haven't had it before now in this kind of real way. So I think those action steps that are bullet pointed on page 67 are going to create the value. And um, they mentioned here provide a meaningful narrative, but also I think that we do need to parallel that to the dollars and cents too around what will be the impact financially. So, um, And then these other bigger rocks to put in the bucket, I think we'll get to those in time, but if we could do one in this next uh, period, I'd be very happy with the progress we've made if we achieve that. Thank you. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, I think this has been a really val valuable report, and reading through it, it certainly resonated with me. The recommendations um, in the report, I think, are really sensible to consider. Um, there's just three main things I just want to make a few comments on. Um, I certainly think the, um, the three points outlined on page 67 that officers have suggested as their approach, I, I, I agree those are high priority areas, in particular the levels of service and better transparency around the MSL budgets. And it's been pleasing even just in the recent annual budget to see that starting um, perhaps better transparency than what I've ever seen before and better information to elected members. And I do want to acknowledge the work of officers in this space. I know there's an awful lot of work that goes into providing very good quality information to us as elected members. Um, but a review such as this does give us the opportunity to re-look at how we do things. And I guess one of the things that have I have often had a level of unease about 
is the amount of work that happens in workshops prior to um, to the meetings. And whilst there, there's clarification being given that those workshops are all open to the public, and I'm pleased about that, I do personally believe that there is a bit of duplication of effort when we look at things in a workshop once or twice and then it comes to the table as well. I do think that there could be a place to consider to do away with the workshops altogether and bring that information right um, straight to this table. I think we have a good framework for decision making through our standing orders. It might be a longer meeting, but when you put that alongside the, all the work that goes into workshops, my preference, rather than having a few takes at things, would be that that work does in the, in the framework, in the context of a meeting, um, with the decision-making framework that we have. I think decisions in workshops or even direction that's provided in workshops does not always have that robust framework. Um, that is just a comment that I would, I, I would have, and certainly this is a changing feast. Um, we, when we're looking at perhaps, while we're looking at perhaps doing things differently, I'd just like to put that out there. Um, as, as doing things quite differently as a suggestion. The other thing I just wanted to make a quick comment about was is the capital programme, and there's certainly comments on page 81 in the report about um, PEPs officers being, have overcommitted the level of infrastructure spend that council could actually be um, achieved or be delivered in the past, and I think that's been um, quite a challenge for us. It hasn't always assisted our decision making in, in reaching a realistic capital programme. That's going to be a big challenge going forward, and I think that's going to have to be um, <coughs> something that we really rely on offers giving very realistic advice to us as elected members about what can actually um, be achieved so that our decision-making relies on honest and accurate information in that space. Um, and yeah, that's, that, that can be a challenge at times, but when we're told um, by officers that 100% of, of an unrealistic program is going to be delivered, that doesn't assist our decision making. And I, I, I'm sure that I can see that that is changing, and I'm sure I, I will be looking. I hope that we will get much better, um, more realistic inf um, advice from officers as we look to try and. Um, determine a realistic capital programme going forward, because at the moment we've got this big bubble that just gets pushed from year to year to year, and at some point we're really going to have to address that so that we don't have this ongoing huge bubble of carry forwards from year to year. Um, but thank you to the officers, this has been a really useful piece of work. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. First, to indicate I do have an additional um, recommendation here, but would just make a couple overall comments and then um, in the Mayor's hands in terms of the order that he wants to take things in. The work did give rise, I feel, to a set of useful recommendations. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit challenged in terms of what I had hoped to see from, from a consultant in this regard. Um, to be honest, it felt like a little bit of facilitated self-reflection and it's just kind of come back towards us. And I would hope that when we do make the effort to um, secure consulting services in these kind of examples, that we look for um, uh, you know, additional kind of expert analysis, comparative analysis, and some real heft to things. Um, you know, it, it came back through the, the officer's um, comment in the report here, you know, that we were aware of most of these issues and they're kind of in train. So I think it's been useful in that it's landed some things in ink. Um, but I would have liked a bit more um, by way of comparative and expert analysis um, to support some of that direction of travel. Having said that, I do think it's a useful set of recommendations, and if we can land even a fraction of them um, in this next uh, long-term plan cycle, we'll be doing much better for, by the community, and hopefully um, as many as possible can be landed. Um, as indicated, there's one in particular I'd like to ensure that we do land in the next, which is the subject of that additional recommendation. Which yeah. is on the screen yeah, yeah, in front we'll of do, us. We'll do that second. Uh, second. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I just wanted to speak very briefly. Um, having not gone through a 10-year plan process, this was very interesting to sort of read with a fresh perspective on how this process works, particularly in the context 
at the annual plan we've just gone through. And so I only have two brief comments. One is on recommendation 10, and I don't know if that's what Councillor Barrett's talking about or not. OK, no. So I think my understanding of what Masoon was looking for was us to give some indication of if we disagree with the prioritisation that's been put forward in the report and if we had any suggestions. And so for me, recommendation 10, which talks about um, council potentially benchmarking ourselves against other councils across time between activities, um, to me, I would hate to see us wait four years before looking at doing that. So if there was scope to move that up the priority list to a medium or a high priority, I'd be happy to see that happen. Um, I think it's important that we understand how what we're doing intersects with what the rest of the sector is doing. And often um, we're making decisions where we might be wildly ahead or wildly behind what other areas are doing, but we don't know because we don't see that benchmarking. So I'd be very open if there is scope for that to be prioritised doing so. And the other comment I wanted to make was around, and I, I think this has been covered in the report, but I want to make it anyway because I don't entirely know if the language that's been used here is the same as what I'm thinking, is in the annual plan discussions there were a lot of increases to budgets where when asked what the budget actually was, the answer was we don't know. You know, we've increased a budget by 100 grand, and then we say, OK, so what is the actual budget? And they say, we don't know. Well, if you're increasing a your budget, surely you've got a budget figure that you're increasing. And for me, it makes a material difference if you've got a budget that's a million dollars and you're increasing it to 1.1 versus if you've got a budget that's $10 million, they're increasing to 10 million point one. So I, I think that's covered in the scope of this report, but if it isn't, I, I'm just putting it out there that I think it would be useful to be able to know what the actual MSL budgets are, at least in terms of figures, so that we know when we're increasing them what baseline we're actually increasing from. But I'm seeing a few confused looks around me, so maybe that's just an annual budget thing that's not the same in the long-term plan. I don't know. But anyway, thank you for the report. I think it's very interesting, and I'm looking forward to this year's long-term plan. Great. Thank you, councillors. We'll come back to your, um, your additional one, uh, councillor, next. OK, we'll vote on this, please. Past 16 votes, four and none against. Right, we have an additional uh, recommendation, and I'll, I'll go to you, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, colleagues. Hopefully reasonably straightforward here. Um, this uh, deals with recommendation 22, which is on page 85 of the reports, and it's around benefits tracking the area that I was asking um, questions in. And I think what we heard from the officers was an acknowledgement um, that it was on, the, on, you know, it was on the radar to work on, but that um, as it is signaled as a low priority, there's a risk that it would bounce to the 27-30 cycle, which would mean, because it's benefits realization looking back, it might be whoever's around this table in 2030 who finally gets to realize the benefit of, of, of what um, we're looking at today. I would like to ensure that that lands in the 24-27 window, and that's what this recommendation does. It directs um, to ensure that the next um, LTP um, picks up these recommendations around um, tracking a benefit realization. I certainly get a lot of feedback, and I expect you do too, from the community about what's happening to my money. This will help us answer that question, so I'd ask for your support. Okay. No other speakers? We'll go for the vote. Thank you. Has passed 16 votes for, none against. Right, we'll move to number 11, which is a uh, report from marketing, and I'll invite Jess up. This is around a uh, sponsorship request around the New Zealand Food Awards. Good afternoon, um, councillors. Thank you for your time today. Um, the only point that I will make about the report um, is that under the support and funding policy, public entities aren't eligible for applicants applications to this fund. Um, however, as it is our policy, we are able to um, go against this, and I've had um, advice that we would just need to note it in the recommendation if we were to go with option two. Um, otherwise, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jess. I'll open it up. Um, Councillor Hancock. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor, and thanks, uh, Jessica. Look, just one really quick question. Um, can you just explain why the, the change of uh, status between uh, years two and three from category partner to strategic partner? Uh, yes, so that is in relation to um, the event being in Auckland for two of the years and the third year being in Palmerston North. Great, thank you. No That's helpful. Councillor Johnson. 
Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Jess. Do we have um, any um, evidence of either financial or other type of benefit from investing in this sponsorship? Um, so we have a list of benefits that have been outlined by Massey in relation to the event. Um, their benefits include um, things like alignment to the event um, and a, lo a lot of more acknowledgement kind of based benefits. One of the biggest things um, that they noted in their report was when the event was in Palmerston North, a lot of the sales were um, out from outside the region. I think in the report I noted that it was 54% of ticket sales, sorry, 44% of attendees. So that does bring economic benefit when it is in the city. So when it is outside of the city, where it's more, um, it, it's harder to quantify in terms of a monetary amount. Okay, thank you. And does Massey University contribute to it financially as well? Yes, they are the, um, they are the lead funder in, in the event. Okay, and what about, is the funding through CEDA? No, no there isn't, no. So CEDA doesn't fund any type of event like this. Okay, right, thank you. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr Mayor. If we don't fund year one and two and just fund year three, will they still hold the conference in Palmerston North? No. So it is a three-year contract that we would be um, entering into with Massey Food Awards. Okay. And um, I guess te teasing out Councillor Johnson's question, so there's no identifiable benefits other than acknowledgements for years one and two? Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, 2.1 on page 94 talks about the program 1480 being fully allocated for the current year and the expectation that that will be similar for, for the following year. What, um, how does this program compare to other programs that have been funded through that program in terms of, uh, there, there's an assessment here of you know, that some of those um, things are achieved or partially achieved. How does that compare to other things that have been allocated already from this fund? So um, everything else that has been um, applied to under this fund goes through very similar questioning process. Um, so we have a contestable um, application that people go through and um, we assess their um, merits on those same principles. So that's part of the support and funding policy priorities that is listed in the policy. Yep, yep, I'm aware of that. So how does this proposed program oh, yep. compare to those? Like, are they often at all achieved or some of them partially achieved? No, no, definitely. So some of them are partially achieved, but it's kind of weighing up how does it affect our city economically and socially, and so that's the kind of way off. And sometimes um, that's kind of an officer's discretion as to how we kind of... Um, utilise those principles that you guys have set in the, okay. in the policy. And can you just give us some examples of other programmes that are funded through um, Program 1480 mm -hmm. this year? Um, so we've had other events such as the Food Innovation Big Day Out that was um, run through Food HQ. We've had a B, um, BE 360, which was a health and wellbeing expo. Um, we have had uh, one or two food stories and things like that. So a lot of them have been food-based um, just for the nature of the applicants so far. The fund, we don't, um, we don't need to publicise it because it is so quickly taken up. So it is on our website and available for people to access under all of the sponsorship. Okay. Um. Yep, that's all for me. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Jessica. Just um, one thing for me, just on, on the math. Um, the, if I total up option two, I still don't have all the money that I have in option mm -hmm. one. Can you yep. just help me through that? Absolutely. So under the support and funding policy, the line is that um, staff have the discretion to award up to 50% of the total fund. If we increase... I'm going to do some quick maths here. If we increase the um, the fund to 80, I wrote this number down, 80, say, $1,000, we can then do the 40, if that makes sense. So that's why it's only an increase of 30, because the current fund is sitting at 54. So apologies if that wasn't clear in the report. No, it, it was um, lost on me, but that's probably mostly my fault. Um, and is there any option for us to continue at the... 12k level. I'm trying to understand what conversations have gone on around bouncing us up to 40, mm -hmm. and 
as well if we bounce up to 40 what the ongoing expectation might be? Yeah. So the reason why there is an increase from 12 to 30, uh, sorry, to 40, um, is the fact that it is Massey Food Awards believe that there is a higher cost to bring the event to Palmerston North than it is to be held in Auckland. So the trade-off for them to come to the city is that we need to help initiate, like, help bring them to the city is kind of where I'm getting at. Is they, they believe that it is a higher cost to have it within Palmerston North. Okay, thank you. Mr Mayor. Councillor Dennison. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. My um, question is probably on the contra to the um, inquiry to so far. I just wanted to know whether or not in year two we could actually get... Uh, the inquiry is whether there's opportunity for us to get it two years out of three rather than just wait for one out of three and, and pay 40 two years out of the... Three. So that, that currently isn't a part of this contract, but it is something that we could um, go back to Massey and propose if um, that was a direction from Council. Maybe a, for comment then. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Isabella. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I just had a quick uh, clarification question. You mentioned ticket sales in year three bringing some economic benefit to the city. Are these tickets to the gala dinner awards night? Yes, it is. Cool. And the proceeds of that go? So that would be, um, they would go back to the event. Great, thank you. Councillor Naylor. Sorry, just one further follow-up question. Um, the 40,000 for the year three, due to the belief that it's more expensive to come to Palmerston North, was there any supporting evidence that backs that? assumption? It's assumption from Massey Food Awards in relation to the previous um, the previous contract negotiations that were done. Um, so no, there isn't on me, but I definitely can ask them in relation to that if you would like that information. I, I personally don't have it that is part of the... It's tickets, it's air tickets, it's hotels, it's getting here. It, it's with every event that comes from an Auckland-based activity. Okay, thank you. Through the Mayor, could I perhaps add to that. Um, in years one, two and three, um, there's also additional benefits around um, the marketing. So whilst we may not have the event happen here for the first two years, um, the name of Palmerston North City Council is obviously associated with the award. So it is included in all of their marketing and on their website. And we also have an opportunity to have a... Um, an award ourselves. So even though they're not here, we do have an award for Palmerston North City Council in years one and two. In year three, we become a strategic partner and so we get more benefits um, as far as naming rights go, as far as marketing goes, as far as um, working with Massey to promote the city. Thank you. Can I just have a follow-up question then? If Palmerston North is to get those benefits in year three, those additional benefits, is there any funding from the marketing budget that could contribute towards that 40000 uh, There is no money in the marketing budget set aside for this. This is a sponsorship budget, which is a contestable um, budget. And as Jess indicated at the beginning, um, this application would need to have um, been noted by council as being outside of that sponsorship funding because it is a public entity. Um, the marketing budget per annum is only $40,000 for the whole year. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Sorry, thanks, Mr Mayor. Just to follow up, um, is there an option of just being a category partner for each year, or is that not an option? Um, it is an option, but the event wouldn't come to Palmerston North. So, what has happened in previous years? Have we just paid the 40,000? Uh, yes, this is the first year that this would um, come under the contestable fund. Um, so yeah, it has been paid, uh, yes. Okay, and so what fund has it been paid from? I don't have that information um, on me. That was previous to me, um, okay. so apologies. Um, and do you know if it was at the same level? Yes, that I do know, yep. So um, it was at the same price in the 12 and 40,000. Oh, sorry, it was at 10. It has increased slightly with inflation, apologies. It was at okay. 10, 10 and, I'm going to go 
sorry, pass it over to Donna there. Uh, you're right, um, but you'll notice that one of the um, options that we've put in is up to 12,000. That's the request that Massey have indicated. Um, we've put up to because we would like to try and negotiate back down to the 10,000, which has been paid in the past. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wood. Sorry to jump in, just one question. This 44% of people who are coming from out of town, do we know what the total number of attendees is? So 44% of 100 uh, so or uh, 308, I believe the number was. Total or 44% is uh, 308? No, to that's the total amount of tickets sold. So 44% of 308, cool. Councillor Hancock. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. And look, uh, apologies for coming back into the queue again. Um, so just seeking a comment really just around um, if we chose option one, uh, which of course uh, includes that uh, forty thousand dollars in the uh, in year three. When that comes back to annual budget, would we actually have some more information around um, justification of that forty thousand um, dollars? I can definitely definitely um, speak to Messi about that and, and get that information. That would be very helpful. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. No. Uh, Councillor Arnott. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, excuse my ignorance, whereabouts is the dinner held in Palmerston? Uh, at Central Energy Trust Arena. Sorry? At Central Energy Trust Arena. That was the previous right. one. Right. Yeah. And um, is Council charging for that they facility? Are, yes. Yes, they are. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jess. That's good. So, Councillors, we have... Um, we have the request there that Council resolves that we confirm either option one or option two or option three. I'm happy to move option one, which is around including a new program of up to 64,000 uh, for three years to support the New Zealand Food Awards as part of the annual budget, 23-24 deliberations in May, June. Look for a seconder. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, look, Councillors, I'll give you a little bit more information. Um, we've actually been a partner for the last five years um, of, of the awards. Um, it's come out of, I suppose, MSL budgets or, or, or internal budgets of, of council in the previous. Um, it, it's been the first time it's ever been here outside Auckland. This has been going, this award's been going, and Chris might know, 40-something years, and it was the first time that it had been hosted here uh, last year. So it was quite a coup to get it. Um, it's a fully, it was, you know, there's televised parts of it, and... Um, it's a fairly big dinner in terms of the awards. Not the dinner itself, but the awards. Um, it's a year-long process, um, and it really does uh, connect with our partners, obviously Massey University, but also um, our CRIs are all there, um, Fonterra, Countdown, MPI, um, and others. Uh, Food HQ included in that as well. Um, We've, uh, in the past, have used it to um, uh, expose city partners, like Mercury Energy's been one. Um, I know Feed HQ have been involved before. But I think the main thing, it really does align with our regional... The economic stuff will have to stack up by itself, and I'm sure the uh, team can give you some numbers around that. Um, but it actually aligns with what we're trying to do as a, as a city in that regional food strategy. So um, I don't think we can do one or the other. I think it's you're either in or you're out. Um, we either don't be a partner at all um, or we be a partner and we put some pressure on and we get the thing hosted here. Um, and again, as I say, it just really links with all of the work that we're doing in food, whether that be around um, innovation, whether it be around um, agri-food and field days and, and rural games and all those sorts of things. It does really fit into that whole um, package. So I hope you'll support it. Councillor Denison. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. One of the things that I was probably wanting to just promote is if this is our key strategy to be centred, or one of our key pillars to be centred as this food and innovative capital of Aotearoa, this one in three rhythm, it just doesn't seem to be putting ourselves leaning forward. And for the, for the um, increment of investment, $28,000 difference, when you're cast that over the 44% of the 308 people, it's only a couple hundred dollars per person of, that would be travelling here out of the city to get them here, which they're spending well more on that in their stay here, um, is to kind of have the thinking of having it like at least every alternate year and getting a rhythm where we're a bit more in the 
front and centre of the whole sector. Um, one in three just seems quite weak um, and, and a bit more of that token approach where I would be promoting a wider, um, longer commitment to term and doing it on the alternate. That would be my approach. That would be where my position would be. If we're going to do it, let's do it. This seems like a, a, um, yeah, a weak approach. Having said that, I'm going to support it. It's like I don't see this as being um, such a big deal. I think we should be in this space. I'm just saying we should be in it more. Thank you. Um, Councillor Naylor. Thank you. I'm not comfortable with um, an additional program of 64,000 to um, achieve this. I do. Th we have got a program already that is specifically for sponsorship opportunities with economic benefits. And I think if this, um, this award stacks up against other contestable options for that funding, then, that's, then that should come from that existing budget. So I won't be supporting this. If it fails, I ha do have an alternate that I've provided, um, seconded by Councillor Johnson, that 12,000 per year over the next three years from program 1480 um, be directed towards this. Um, that obviously does um, have a shortfall in the third year, but I am confident that there would be other money if this was um, a viable, you know, if this was supported, that that could come from other uh, marketing or sponsorship money. It's already been highlighted by the mayor um, that 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 this has already been money that, uh, you know, something that the council has invested in over the last five years that's come from MSL. And I think highlighting that and bringing it um, as a transparent decision to be made is, is a positive one. Um, but if that funding exists, has existed within MSL, then I think I would be more interested in un unlocking that and seeing where that is and utilising that funding for this if it stacks up. So um, won't support it as an additional program, but happy to consider supporting it through our existing budgets. Councillor Johnson. Um, yes, I'm not uh, comfortable to support this. And um, I think a couple of things, really. Um, we've just had um, a quite um, in-depth look at our budgets through the draft annual budget. Um, We've proposed uh, reducing the number of um, furniture replacements that staff can have, uh, the number of computers, the number of printers. Um, we've um, taken uh, money out of the um, MSL budgets. You know, we've taken a good hard look at the budgets and the, and the, the justification for that has been that there's a cost of living crisis, that people are tightening their belts, that people are struggling with their day-to-day -day expenses, and I don't doubt that that's true. Um, this doesn't sit well with me in that context at all. Um, I am pleased uh, that it's come to us instead of it just being paid out of a, a fund and us not knowing about it, but to me, the benefit uh, isn't there. And how I look at it is, uh, if we look at one of our lead sector organisations, like let's say Manawatu Multicultural Council, we only pay them half of this per year for all of the work that they do for the multicultural community. So when I'm looking at value from a dollar, this isn't stacking up for me, and so I'm not prepared to support it. Uh, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I've just been taking a moment to go through all of the partners that the New Zealand Food Awards currently have. Four of them are from Palmerston North. Nine of them are national and one of them is from Auckland. So if you're looking at who's backing this award already, it's us. And yet we're having to grovel here and fight to get this in our city. It's not right. And to be completely frank, in the context of the budget discussions we've just had and the amount of money that we have been trying to save, to spend $64,000 to bring 135 people into the city, that's 44% of 308, that's $475 per person. If we want to give $475 to our hotel providers, let's just do it. Let's just give them 64 grand. I mean, this is not... A, if this was to bring 1,000 people into Palmerston North and put us on the map and we were going to be the top sponsor for the next three years and this was going to be driving innovation and driving investment, sure. But the only 
qualified benefit that has been put in this report of being the sponsor is the people that it brings to our city in year three, and that is 135 people. So that's the only benefit that's been outlined in this. And frankly, I don't think that's a convincing benefit in light of the economic conditions that we're in. And I know I'm being harsh, and I know we have goals of being you know, a leading um, food producer and food um, research city in New, Zeal in New Zealand and in the world. I, I understand all of those goals. But we have to look at, if we're going to invest 64 grand in achieving that goal, is this the place to do it? You know? We've got a, the mayor's off to, goodness, Van Ingen shortly to look at setting up a city partnership Bargain and the opportunities in. that may, what was that? Wagenen, um, looking at the opportunities that might exist to partner with them and their organisations. If, if we want to have this strategy, and this is for the purpose of becoming a leading New Zealand and international food city, then I would rather have created a budget line that said we're going to have 64 grand that we're going to allocate toward um, the attraction and development of that industry, not just to bring 135 people in to go to a conference. So this is an exceptional amount of money for what we're getting out of it. You know, I'd, I'd spend 20 grand doing this. I'd spend 30 grand doing this. But to have no identified benefit for the first two years, and then the only benefit be 135 people in year three, I would rather we just gave the hotel operators some money than doing it this way. This seems very backwards. So I, I think for us to have a gun against our head that we need to be giving this money or it won't come here, I think is short-sighted, given the fact that Palmerston North already is the city that is partnering the most with this event, and um, I, yeah, I don't like the threat. And so my preference will be to decline the request. Councillor Isabella. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. All, my points have uh, all been covered by other speakers. Uh, just wanted to yeah, reiterate that I'm really concerned about the message, the message this move would send to our sector lead organisations have all been there in front of us telling us that they are strapped for cash and that they need more money and that this amount of money is the equivalent or somewhat a little bit more or a little bit less than some of those uh, organisations are getting through our strategic priorities grant, is that what it's called? Yes. Um, for an entire year's operation. So I'm just really uncomfortable with the message that we're sending when we've had them there giving us this message and then if, if we do something like this, as Councillor Wood and Councillor Johnson pointed out, that the value proposition appears quite weak and uh, I completely concur with Councillor Dennison that it should be here. The, the rural games are here. We're here in the heartland. This is all about our identity and what we're building. We shouldn't have to grovel to get it here one out of every three years. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Hancock. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm just going to be pretty brief on this because um, all we're doing here is just uh, referring this through to the, uh, the annual budget discussions, um, which uh, come up uh, uh, in, in a few months' time. Um, so, um, food and innovation really plays to um, our strategic strengths, and uh, for those reasons, I think um, it is worthy of a discussion. And uh, you'll note my uh, question to Jessica really around sort of, um, I would like to have some rigour around uh, what that 40k, uh, what's what's the makeup of that for, for us in terms of uh, a spend from the city. So, uh, those are all things that we can consider further in the future, but. Um, I think it's fairly important that today we actually sort of uh, put, a, put a stake in the ground and say, yes, this is actually what uh, Palmerston North really is uh, about in terms of our strategic strengths. Um, it really shows, um, I think, some support for our existing partners, other organisations that are based here in Palmerston North who are already part of this. So uh, for my money, I think, uh, I'm, well, I'm definitely going to uh, support option one. Thank you. Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillors, it's hard not to get a bit upset with some of you at times. Please, um, you've started mixing this up with other programmes, and, and that's your prerogative. Oh, sorry, Deputy Mayor, you've popped in again. OK, I'll let you go, sorry. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm going to support this because I think that there are times when we need to take some risk around things that we know have the potential to grow. And I'm um, supportive of all those that are involved in the industry here. We've got, um, as we know, leading lights out at Massey University and at other places. We've got um, the hospitality industry, the food industry and so forth here within our city and those 
as mentioned, that we've partnered. I, too, support um, Councillor Dennison in terms of saying, we will, I'd like us to be front and centre, hosting this all the time. I think it has the potential to grow. I think that um, that 380 would be something or thereabouts that we could actually also promote, um, not only locally, but nationally as well. So this is one of those growth industries, regardless of um, of the circumstances and the times, this is, this is on the move nationally and internationally as well. And we want to promote our own people and what the work that they're doing, either in science, technology, or um, the delivery of this. So, thank you. Thank you. Look, I'll, I'll start again. Um, please, you've got to support this. This is one of our lead sectors. This is our world-class offering. We've, got, we've gone down some rabbit holes here with um, comparing it to other um, uh, community grants. And you, you, you're right, you, you, you can do that if you want to, but I think you're really mixing it up. Um, this is supporting our world-class offering as a city. You can forget about Wageningen if you don't support this, because they won't want to know some city that won't even support its, um, its own national food awards. If you ask anybody internationally uh, around what Palmerston North is known for, it is that food science. Today we just had one of our leading city uh, people be appointed CEO of New Zealand Plant and Food. Now, we'd be silly and vote this down, and you're just telling those people we're not interested. This is our food, this supports our food strategy. Now, I admit that there probably needs to be a little bit more um, business case around the benefits. It's just not the dinner, by the way. There's a year of uh, uh, promotion, um, uh, other um, finalist awards, um, there's other meetings that happen around that, so all of those things probably need to be factored in. I'm the city's biggest advocate and sales agent, and I'll tell you now, it is hard to get things here. And the reality is when you're sitting in front of a whole lot of bean counters in Auckland and they're telling me in New Zealand flights are this, this, this and this, your hotels are this, 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 and they do the math, it actually does cost a lot to come here. So you just need to get re in the real world with that. But we're going to try hard to try and get it and get more. But we won't even get off the first step if we just vote this down. And you'll be sending a massive negative signal to some of our partners. So look, refer it to the... Uh, the budget. There needs to probably be a bit more work on the actual business case and the benefits. Uh, and the benef benefits are more than just the economic benefit of having a dinner. Uh, it's the support of key, the key sector and the key partners. So please don't go down rabbit holes. You have to vote for this. Thank you. We'll vote. Has passed 12 votes for and four against. All right, on that note, we might just have a little break. <laughs> we all need it. All right, back in here and, um, at 22. Thank you.
and number 13 will bring up next. So uh, this is around further information on council land options with the artificial turf long-term plan program 1133 sports fields artificial um, football pitch and invite um, Aaron Phillips. Page 155. Uh, good afternoon, Mr Mayor and Councillors. Uh, Aaron Phillips, Parks Activity Manager. We have apologies from Anne-Marie Moore, who's unable to make the meeting today. Um, uh, happy to take uh, the report as read. Just a couple of quick notes. Um, various work has been done over the uh, last few years on possible locations for an artificial turf that involved council land. Um, they've all been considered as part of a potential home of football, however, not as an artificial turf on its own. Uh, a number of those looked at partnership opportunities on the basis that they would maximise the use of the turf and potentially have some cost-sharing opportunities. Um, the council need for an artificial turf has been identified in a number of the RSL reports and it's based around training field provision, whereas the home of football uh, was a strategic direction from New Zealand football and cent the central football fo for the Central Football Federation. Um, and happy to take questions. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, thanks, Aaron. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One is about uh, in 2.4, it mentions that a home of football is a cluster of facilities in one location, including a turf. What are the other facilities that a home of football encompasses? I think it's page 156. Help. Thank you, Councillor. Um, the New Zealand Football National Strategies identify, Strategy identifies uh, regional home of footballs as having two sand-based fields, one artificial pitch, access to indoor futsal courts, administration space, sports science rooms, lecture rooms, flood lighting and first aid facilities. Uh, that varies slightly from some of the criteria that were put together for the RSL reports on a home of football where they had been considering uh, instead of two sand-based fields, access to three to five grass fields without necessarily the sand-based. In terms of what sand-based fields means, for example, is the, the arena main oval was a sand-based pitch, as is our field at Memorial Park. Um, they have much better performance in terms of drainage and the ability to host more activities on them. OK, so what, what is lacking at arena for the home of football facilities then? Uh, some of the questions um, around arena would be um, the priority of access for football over other codes, what, how much use football would need of the uh, one artificial turf in three to five grass fields or perhaps one to two other, other turfs depending on their quality. Would that rule out other codes using those fields completely? Is, is the home of football going to be a year-round facility where they'd need priority of demand? Um, there was some question around the cost of access to facilities compared to other other options, um, and I'd probably need to go back into the RSA report to go into further detail. Okay, thank you. So in the, the kind of traffic light um, um, in 4.3, um, there are some extra criteria that have been put on this traffic light compared to the report that we had last month. Um, and as far as I can see, they're on the right-hand side. So one is fit with home of football. The other one is club capture. Can you, can you explain what that means, club capture? Um, there's always been a, 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 I, don't know, I guess, a tension that if you're providing an artificial football field that you want the entire football community to use, um, if you position it in a, in a space where it naturally aligns with one particular club, there might be a tendency for the one cl club to dominate its use. Um, and so we, we've considered that, uh, for example, if uh, an artificial pitch went at Scoglin Park, Red Sox Club Rooms is just across the way at Vortier Park, uh, there's some, some risk or that would need to met some sort of management to ensure that the, the facility was available to the, the whole football community and not dominated by one club. So, so is the club capture at CET Arena Marist, is it? Is that the thought there? Yes, that yeah. would be the risk, okay. yeah. All right. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Councillor Denison. Thank you, Mr Mayor. 
a similar line around just exploring this home of football um, phrase, even on that same um, assessment tool that we've gone, it says that we would require prioritisation, which is under the home of football concept, um, for central fo football to relocate the admin offices. Can I understand where the admin offices are currently? Uh, up at Massey University. They are up there? Yes. Okay, how long have they been up there for, do you know? Uh, now I'm at danger, Councillor. Um, not having authored the um, RSL report, um, I believe they've been out there for several years, yeah, two, two to three years, but uh, I'm not probably going to be able to glance around and get an answer for you. Sorry. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, and um, I'm fairly familiar with the arena. Would there be um, available office space at the arena? Like, I'd imagine for the couple of staff that it looks like they have on the website. Possibly speculating outside my area of expertise, but I would assume so, yes. Okay. And can I understand um, Central Football, their head office is in the Hawke's Bay, is that how I'm understanding it correctly? Correct, yeah. And so when they talk about home of football, are they talking about homes of football for Central Football? Because they'd have, no doubt have their Hawke's Bay main facility. Um, I'm again a little bit cautious answering, um, Councillor, but my understanding is the home of football for the Central Federation would be one location, uh, and but there's no guarantee that they, or, uh, there's no undertaking to shift their offices to that location. Um, okay. Has there been a little bit cautious in that answer, though, I have to say. That's okay. Yeah. Since our last meeting that we've had, have they given any other follow up comments around um, further investment opportunity that they might have, um, that have um, eventuated since we last considered this item? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, officers have followed the recent FIFA announcement of $14 million allocated to New Zealand football, but we're not aware of how that New Zealand football is proposing to use that at this stage. Okay, great. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Finlay. Going into this home of football uh, name as such, um, where did it come from? We don't have a home of rugby, or we don't have a home of hockey, or table tennis, but suddenly we have a home of football. Where did that come from? Uh, it's part of the New Zealand Football National Facilities Strategy. Um, again, apologies for being slightly cautious in my um, answers. I'm not immersed in this particular topic, but um, uh, I believe it was originally developed in 2010 and reviewed in 2016, and as part of that, they identified... Uh, what they thought they needed as a code to develop in each of the seven or eight federations that are through New Zealand. And uh, for the Central Federation, it was identified that creation of a home of football was needed. Some, they, if you look at the National Facilities Strategy, they have a number of examples of homes of football internationally and in other places in the country where they've used this model to try and grow the sport. So there are several homes of football in New Zealand? Uh, yes. Okay, so we're looking. It's not at the national home of football. Okay. It's the home of football for the Central Federation. Okay, so if we decide, well, if they say that the home of, if they say the home of football is going to be Palmers of the North, have they already said that and they declare that it's going to be here, or are they just saying it might be here? Uh, they were um, certainly advocating for it to be here with their preference at Massey University. But they haven't said it will be here yet. Uh, well, was implicit in the um, in the proposal to for the facility at the university. I guess the, um, I'd have. To, I'm sorry. Uh, so can, oh, I'll put it another way. Phrase. If we put this turf at Massey, do we have a guarantee that Palmerston North will be the home of football for Central New Zealand? Uh, for the Central Federation, yes, that would be tied up in the associated agreements that would be formed as part of that. There would that be deal. a guarantee. There would be, uh, similar as, to, as with the university was done for the hockey turf, there would be some sort of memorandum of understanding, including agreement with the code about how it would be operated and community access and, and, and so on. That would be before we put it in? Yes, you would need to sign that off before we could commit to Okay, it. thank you. Grant, or otherwise. Uh, Councillor Harper. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Aaron. Just one question. Um, page uh, 159 on point 5.2. Um, the capital cost of 
one million, and fifty percent of that being met by grants and subsidies. How guaranteed would that be? You're putting me on the spot there, Councillor. Um, uh, I ha hey, we haven't um, the. The project hasn't proceeded to the point of putting together fundraising plans. Um, if council were contributing 50% of it, you're a reasonable way along the the path. But um, you would, we would, the fundraising plan would be seeking a further 1.1 to 1.4 million dollars, um, not an inconsequential amount of money, and one that council found challenging to raise for Arena Manor Two's artificial turf. But this presumably would have the backing of Central Football, and hopefully New Zealand Football. But it wouldn't have um, use, um, central football's backing if it was at arena. That was the undertaking during the previous yeah, report, okay. yes. Okay, so it's, that's what you're saying, 50% would be raised by other means? That's the assumptions uh, in the current 10-year plan, although there's the issue of, of operational grant versus capital contribution that you've been grappling with. Um, the external, there would need to be a fundraising plan put together and that could be put together as part of reporting back um, on any agreements or undertakings of the other parties. Okay, thank you very much, Aaron. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Councillor Hancock. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor, and, and thanks, Aaron. Just a really quick question from me. Um, just on the traffic light system there on page um, 158 there, CET Arena has got an amber uh, light against adequate space. Can you explain that f a little bit more for us? That relates back again to the, the question of the home of football indicating one uh, artificial turf and two sand-based fields. Um, the re previous report talked about an alternative being one um, artificial turf and three to five natural fields. And then the previous answer about the, the capacity of the facility to cope with what football's demands might be versus other codes. At the moment at Arena one or 2, we've got one artificial and two grass fields, other, if you exclude the oval, uh, in a tra training field area. I understand in the Arena Master Plan, there was proposals to realign the rear fields, which would provide three grass fields and one artificial at the rear fields. Um, but there's still that question of, is that entirely committed to football and excludes other codes? Is there sharing available or not? Uh, sort of, there's a lot of, a lot of um, detail to be worked through. So there's no blueprint at the moment in terms of uh, other field expansion at CET? There's no uh, agreed plan? The, uh, other than the review of the master plan that's underway, okay, uh, which I'm not, not familiar with. Thanks, Aaron. It's helpful. Mr Ben. Thanks, Aaron. That's, um, that's, uh, the, the question's done. Appreciate your answering those. And councillors, we have the... Uh, further information there on um, council land options and uh, resolving that council receive the memo titled Further Information on Council Land Options for an Artificial Turf Long-Term Plan Programme 1133 Sports Fields Artificial um, Football Pitch presented to council today, 5th of April uh, 2023. Um, I'm happy to move that and seconded by the Deputy Mayor. also have a, an additional recommendation which... Um, I'll get put up as well. And this is around um, uh, the Chief Executive be directed to continue discussions about potential solutions for football facilities with Central Football and Mass University, re governance, management, funding, and operational equipment requires, noting that any decision uh, to act would require Council's further approval. And, Councillors, I sent that out last night after. Um, having a discussion with officers, including the CE. Um, and the key points here were um, these options um, really would give a thorough discussion at a senior management level to, ex to understand exactly, because there's a few questions floating around about whatever the home of football exactly is, and exactly what is in and what is out, whether it's operational or whether it's um, capital. And again, there is ways of dealing with that on, on all sites. But there does seem to be some confusion um, around who is doing what or who is putting what in. And although I wasn't at the meeting, there, there was some, clearly it wasn't well, some of the questions weren't well answered and, um, and Council's hand was seen as being somewhat forced, so I can understand how you got to where you got to. Um, 
and and I, look, I've I've had a couple of calls from different people, and I did say to people I felt there was a few own goals being scored here in the presenting of this. Um, but I just want to be explicit. If we did go down this path, it gives uh, Wade the opportunity to discuss opportunities before anything could happen. It would need to come back to um, council, and it just it just totally covers off. And it keeps Arena very live, and it may end up going back to Arena. But the conversation, and the com but the conversations, I believe, need to be still had, and I, they haven't been had. So, um, and it, uh, at this stage, it does remove any reference to partnerships because I don't know what that partnership is, and and with, through some of the conversations and questions, that's mm -hmm. you are of the same thinking as well. So, councillors, I open it up for any comments. Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you for um, picking this up and bringing it back to us today. Um, I'm, I'm supportive of this as a direction. I think this is where um, some of us wanted to be um, when this report was brought, to keep both conversations live. And I'm sure you're not alone, Mr Mayor, in receiving phone calls from various sections of the footballing community um, who are you know, known for their tribalism in these matters. Um, there's no question that we accept the need, that there is a need in our community for another artificial turf for football. No question at all. We are not against the turf. That was never the discussion. The discussion was about what can we afford? And that's still the live debate even today after that. Yes, the arena does not meet all of the criteria, um, noting that some of those are very much driven by central football. Um, but the criteria that's not there is our criteria around affordability. And at the moment, that is the box that arena ticks that Massey doesn't. And until Massey and central football can come back and show me how they tick the affordability box, mm. then <laughs> I'm still, well, maybe goal hanging might be the analogy. There. You know, I don't know whether this is doable for us to have a home of football at Massey. Um, it's certainly aspirational, might be ambitious, but um, <laughs> is there an opportunity there? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's an ambitunity, but... It'll fall in your um, lap. <laughs> but we don't know. It's important to keep advancing both conversations so that we can look at all of the important bits of the decision-making that we need to be able to make a decision, not just for football, or for central football, or for Massey, but for Palmerston North. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Don't know quite how I can follow that, but I will say I do appreciate your efforts to uh, keep the ball in play, even if it is nowhere near the goal. Nowhere near the goal. We've got a long ways to go, but um, I do appreciate the efforts. Reflecting on the, on the meeting that we had, I think there's two principal areas of concern for me. One, Councillor Bowen has highlighted around affordability. The other was around benefits to the city and actually making sure that we were in a position um, to capitalize on that. Um, you know, I was just at the, um, at the volleyball um, secondary school at the final, um, and man, what a buzz, you know, and, and I talked to Tony, the CEO of, of Volleyball New Zealand there, you know, and it is about co-location at a very micro scale that actually gives that benefit to codes and if we've already got some investment in the city, um, to me it would make great sense to be building on that investment um, rather than being a bridge in a short commute away. So those are kind of the, the concerns that I had then and that remain with me. Um, I would like to support the direction here, uh, Mr. Mayor, but with one key addition. So I'd like to see an amendment um, which would introduce the word location before the word governance so that it is very clear in those conversations that location remains on the table as a very live issue and one that certainly the last time we had a chance to have a vote around location at this table, Massey wasn't looking like it was close to the goal, frankly. So it needs to understand that explicitly in these conversations. And to me, the best way to do that would be to include that by way of amendment. I understand that um, Councillor Naylor is happy um, to second that. And I think that would then be a fair reflection for um, the um, for the chief executive to move forward with having that explicit um, component there around um, location. I, you know, if it was totally up to me, I'd probably just go city side. Um, but I recall that I was on the 8th of March here, 
criticizing central football for being very dogmatic about where it needs to be. And I think it would be unfortunate for me to turn around so quickly and become suddenly dogmatic about where it needs to be, even if my feeling is, is, is towards that. So I think simply indicating location um, as, as that additional um, component of the recommendation would be um, where I'd be comfortable. So. Yeah, I'm quite happy if the seconder is just to put the word location and we don't need to do a, a, a separate amendment. I think that's sensible. Great. Thank you. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr Mayor. I'm really happy to support both recommendations and I think adding the word location is a really good idea. I think um, bringing this back to the table with both Central Football and with Massey University in the discussion is a good idea. Um, I'd also like Councillor Bond, didn't like the way it finished the other day, but I think things weren't clear as well, so I think bringing it back for the CE to have a discussion going forward would be a good way forward. So really happy with this recommendation and thank you for bringing it forward to us. Councillor Jenison. I uh, certainly see an open mind to keep discussions, but actually the predetermination of the uh, feasibility report was... Um, uh, unfortunately um, uh, positioned because of their set view, both Central Football and Massey to have it at Massey and that theme come through overweighting any other consideration around the investment. And in fact even the uh, investment proposition was so weak, I was, I was floored at how, how limited the other partners, so, so to speak, had skin in the game or had dollars and cents in the mix. And um, to, to say oh, I needed to be at Massey and for us to be foot in the bull, uh, it's, it's just not um, a, a great position to be in. And so uh, why you might have mentioned, Mr Mayor, not being there, that it may not have been presented very well, well, that was one of the fundamental flaws around how it was positioned, actually, I'm calling that out. Um, and then so, therefore, around the ongoing engagement, because if we are going to invest into another... Um, artificial turf, we'd want it to be used well, and central football seemed to be positioning with the, um, with the need around that, that we'd want a key partner to, to obviously have, have a, a use of that and benefit. Um, but gosh, I've got a long way to come if you think uh, I'm going to promote an investment back out at Massey when I, I can see the need at the arena uh, for this as far as the location conversation goes. And uh, if there's no immediate um, engagement around the possibility of that investment being at Arena, uh, then, therefore I think this could be a really short process. Um, and because I, I have a fairly clear mind on that position, uh, and, um, and I think that's fair to outlay that now before we um, give some uh, other um, indication otherwise. So um, this, this is negotiating in goodwill, uh, in good faith, and so therefore I'll lay it on the table. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Mayen. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, nobody would be surprised that I'm fully supportive of this after our last little debate on this, this one. Um, the home of football at Massey. Um, I hear about location, location, location. The gates at Arena are closed, locked. The gates aren't closed and locked at Massey. Potential of nine fields at Massey with the turf. Um, so I can understand why Football are saying they want that to be the home of football with their officers already there, nine, potential, potential of nine fields, okay, as opposed to two. If we put the artificial turf in, currently we've got two at Arena, okay. Um, so I won't dribble too much. I'll just quickly just get it out that I fully support this. I think it's great that we get it back around the table, whereas that was my aim last time was to get it around the table. Let's see what they're going to bring, okay. If Massey and central football aren't bringing anything else but their $600,000 worth of land, well, they ain't bringing anything, OK? So let's get it round the table. Let's put a bit of, bit of faith, a bit of belief in those that are actually having discussions with them that they can come back with something a little bit better than that and we can get a better deal and get this thing on the move. We need to fully understand that when you want to be the home of something, you want access to your home at any time of day or night when you want to go in there. You don't want to be told when you can go home and when you can't. You don't want to have to be working around other people living in your home and you go in when they decide to move out. Okay? So we need, to, we need to understand that from a supporting perspective and what we're really trying to achieve here. Thank you. Councillor Arnott. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I certainly welcome this additional motion, which I'll be supporting, and look forward to being able to make an informed decision around this table. Thank you very much. All right, councillors, thanks for your comments. Um, just, just in reply and, and to wind up, um, I'm agnostic myself to, to venues, but there obviously has been a bit of thinking going into this. I think the missing thing here is any decision needs some external funding. It absolutely does. Otherwise, we're gifting a whole lot to another entity. Um, and I think that's the main crux of where things went a little bit um, all over the place. Um, the Central Women's football team is actually based in the city, so there is a little bit of um, heritage here um, in football, and it would be nice to think that we can come to some sort of arrangement, wherever that is, um, but again, it needs to be a true partnership, and with a true partnership, both parties need to put things on the table. So at the moment, the city certainly is, it just it really depends how much that'll be, but if we are going to partner with somebody, they need to put something on the table as well. So I think we can leave that um, in, in the independent hands of our CE and perhaps other officers to have those um, uh, firm discussions with our, with, our, with our colleagues. So I hope you support this. So we'll take the two together if that's okay and we'll vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll now go back to the previous item, and thank you to the staff for waiting. Um, and this is around uh, our draft water supply bylaw 2023. Approval of the consultation, and I'll ask Peter and Lily to come up. Thank you. Now, councillors, uh, I'll take the report as read, but just to note um, the following. The, the proposed bylaw before you will replace the current one in its entirety. Um, the bylaw regulates the distribution of, dist uh, of treated water around the city and also the relationship between water supply customers and, customer and council as the service provider. Um, the intent of the proposed bylaw is the same as the current one. However, we have made improvements to the structure and wording to improve the um, clarity of purpose, readability and implementation. Some of the specific changes include and more is outlined in the, uh, in the statement of proposal, uh, acknowledging the tangata whenua a kaitiaki of water and particularly rangitane or manawatu's role as mana whenua. Elevating the backflow pre prevention provisions within the body of the bylaw and updating the water supply area map um, in line with legislative requirements and best practice, we're looking to engage feedback from the community on whether we've got these changes right. Um, happy to take questions on the proposed bylaw um, and to my colleague here, Peter, as well as, as, as Ricky Fremantle from the water team. Thank you, Lily. Anything else to add, Peter? No. Could I just ask, I mean, obviously, Waters is a, I mean, there's all sorts of, um, it doesn't matter which, which um, political party you talk to, it's, it's, it looks like it's leaving local government in some form, and some sort of entity. So why, if it's leaving, and let's say it is leaving, why would we continue with this work? Um, so yeah, it's a pretty good question to ask. We do have um, some information coming forward about what the three wards reforms would look like. Um, the reason why this is coming forward now is that um, we still have a bylaw and until a change is in effect, we're still responsible for uh, the regulation of that. The bylaw that's been put forward um, identifies a number of changes and improvements to make. Um, the new entities, assuming that's what happens, um, will have the ability to make their own regulatory instruments, um, which will take effect similar to a bylaw. Uh, but what they are likely to be doing is adopting similar provisions to what we have in our bylaw already. So these improvements will become the baseline for the new entity to take forward. So 
that, that the rationale is improving the baseline, so when they do leave, they've got a stronger, stronger bottom line, is it? Exactly. Right, yeah. okay, thank you. Councillor Hancock. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Look, just a very quick question. Um, we reviewed the bylaw in uh, 2020. Once that review's taken place, is there any timeline in terms of the lapsing of the previous bylaw, or the existing bylaw? The legislation doesn't specify a time frame, so it's just uh, the council will need to choose a course of action that they'd like to take, and that was the resolution that council made was that a amended bylaw to be um, presented to you, which is what is before you today. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and, I, and I understand that COVID uh, intervened. Thanks. Thanks, Mr Mayor. All right. Okay, that's no more questions. Um, thank you, Lily. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, councillors, so we have the uh, resolutions there around council approving the draft Palmerston North Water Supply Bylaw 2023 for consultation, attachment one, and that council delegate authority of the chief planning officer to approve minor amendments to the consultation document prior to publication. I'm happy to move that, seconded by uh, the Deputy Mayor. And look, I just, um, I questioned why we were doing this, because of those obvious reasons of waters leaving in some form and going somewhere, um, but not this entity. Um, and why did we need to, to carry out this work? But I think if we can get the strongest possible um, uh, baseline and uh, bylaw, um, that protects um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the supply of water in, in, in our city, then that can only be good. So um, I'm more than happy that it continues. And it may take a little while for everything to uh, fathom out to where things finally end up. Uh, Councillor Dennison. Thank you, Mr Mayor. What I rise to speak on behalf of is why residents, even across the country, have actually raised their concerns on this three water uh, reform around wanting local management and having concern that their rates are subsidising upgrades in other areas and the like. What, what floats on top for me is that residents are concerned about losing their local say. <laughs> this might be their only chance to have an opportunity and I don't think we should shortchange them on that. And so if we uh, still have the opportunity to replace bylaws or upgrade them, let's engage our community. They want to have a say um, locally, and so I see this as um, very straightforward. I'm supportive of these recommendations and supportive of that community voice. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, there's no further comments. We will vote. Thank you. Has passed 15 votes for, none against. Thank you. All right, we'll move through to number 14, which is around Freedom Drive um, Road Reserve. And I'll ask uh, Bryce, our Acting Chief Infrastructure Officer, uh, to speak to this. This is page 163. Uh, yes, uh, kia ora, councillors. Um, look, pretty administrative matter. I'm um, so happy to take the report as read and take any questions. Thank you. So, Bryce, just um, in essence, this is normal practice where we, we look to take a bit of land um, at the appropriate time. Uh, yes, correct. When people are developing in the private market, obviously they, they typically don't want to be looking after the roads, so they vest them to council. Um, just in terms of how this development panned out and I guess how it was staged, um, we took provision of the land under a certain way, but it wasn't technically vested as road. So now that the development's ready to go, um, best practice would say that we need to re um, change it to road now, otherwise everyone would have to apply to an easement, which will be rather cumbersome on them. Right, OK, thank you. Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Bryce. Just wanted to check in um, paragraph 2.4. Uh, you say that the developers constructed the road um, to council standards. What, what kind of verification is done around that? Is that...? 
Uh, so as, uh, as part of applying for the title process, um, our in-house development team go out and they inspect the roads. Um, so earlier on, sorry to step back, earlier on in the process we specify to our engineering standards of what a road mm. needs to look like along with all the other services. Prior to applying for a, um, a title, we go out and do inspections on that as well and make sure it was indeed lifted to that standard. And um, uh, that is a key requirement of being able to get a title, is our sign-off as the regulator, that it's up to our standard. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bryce. That's, uh, that's done with questions, so thank you. Um, so, colleagues, the resolution there is around Council approving uh, the dedication of the current local purpose reserve road, described as Lot 44 DP 559-569, which is owned by Parkinson City Council as road within the Freedom Drive subdivision. Very legal speak. I'm happy to move that. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Um, I don't think there's no any need to um, prolong things other than this is uh, pretty mandatory stuff, business as usual. So uh, thank you to the officers for the report. And if we could vote, please. <coughs> So is yours not working? That's telling you something, isn't it? When the when it's at this time and all the all the technology starts dying. Well, do it with a show of hands. I'll just wait to the officers. Are you okay with a show of hands? Okay, so uh, with a show of hands, please, all those in favour? Against? That's carried unanimously, thank you. Okay. Right, we'll look forward to now uh, number 15, um, which is the council work schedules on page 167. Um, from the acting CE, you don't want to speak to that? You sure? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Okay, I'm hoping there's no questions to this, but we have here the Council resolves to receive its work schedule dated 5th of April 2023. I'm happy to move it, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that any matters arising to it. There being none, we will vote with a show of hands. All those in favour? Against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Recommendations. So we have recommendations from committee, uh, and that is uh, from Strategic and Finance Committee of the 22nd of March 2023 meeting. Um, and I'll ask the Chair, Councillor Dennison, to speak to that. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And um, standing to move the recommendations from the Strategy and Finance Committee to Council to be adopted, I just want to add uh, one line of text, which was to the first recommendation, which is noting that the lease will be 500 plus GST. The committee actually had delegation to approve this, and we moved the tranche of leases, as you may recall, but this one didn't actually note the increase um, that was intentional from 150 moving it up to 500 to fit within our um, policy. Um, and so therefore it was suggested that it gets brought back for um, adoption at council, noting that clearly, so um, there's no um, ambiguity around that clause. And the only other thing that I was just wanting to note, in the order paper, the clause numbers are gonna be adjusted when we um, vote against those res um, Resolutions, which is a fairly minor thing, just because of the order of business that we did that day. But otherwise, I look forward to second. I thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so we're just going to vote for this first one, um, Councillor Naylor. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, moved by Councillor Dennison as the chair, seconded by Councillor Naylor. Thank you. 
of any other matters arising to this. There being none, we'll do this with a show of hands. All those in favour? Against? That's carried, thank you. Okay, welcome back, Councillor. We are now, um, I'll ask you as the Chair, um, Councillor Denison, to speak to the second. Oh, yes, um, really just uh, moving the balance of the recommendations um, for Council adoption. Thank you. Okay, and were you happy to move those? Yes. Yep, and seconded by Councillor Naylor, thank you. Are there any matters arising to these? There being none, we will look to vote. All those in favour? Against? And that is... Um, Councillor McKellard online, if you could just let... Yes, he did, well done. I'm just checking your screen hadn't frozen. Okay, so, well done. I'll now declare the meeting closed. If I could ask um, uh, Councillor Fitzgerald to close us out. Karakia, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kia ora tātou anō. Me karakia tātou. Tū taua mai i runga, tū taua mai i raro, tū taua mai i roto, tū taua mai i waho. Kia tau ai, te mauri tū, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, haumie, huie, taiki, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, people. Um, yeah, we'll do the count.